um, discussions of Pleistocene hominin dispersal inevitably involve broad generalizations across vast spatiotemporal scales. Now, as a result, the question of how we model movement in regions where there is a limited or fragmentary record becomes even more pertinent. Now, some of these regions are the most interesting, I think, from the perspective of global hominin dispersal, uh, and in such situations, pre-existing site location can become possibly our greatest clue, and predictive models, I think, offer an attractive array of methods for studying and understanding hominin dispersal. However, over-reliance on some kinds of predictive models could be holding back our understanding of key Pleistocene dispersal regions, specifically because of how they interact with the Paleolithic record. Now, when discrete sites are defined in opposition to the wider hominin landscape, it obscures the necessary fact that the hominin behavioural landscape was itself continuous with interconnected localities. Now, furthermore, sites in the Paleolithic record, uh, they tend to be both sort of isolated and clustered. You know? So I mean isolated in the sense that they are often distributed along a sort of vast time depth with huge error margins in, in the dating of sites um, that are considered broadly contemporary and across large geographical areas as well. But they're also often clustered in that some areas and some geological deposits are disproportionately studied or they provide unique conditions of preservation. Um, and I think inductive predictive models in particular, um, out of predictive models, they exacerbate this issue by emphasising site location versus uh, environmental variables at the expense of a more nuanced understanding of hominin adaptation and subsistence in the landscape. But predictive models aren't solely uh, responsible for this issue. So rather, I think the major issue is that the weaknesses of predictive models become more pronounced in combination with the site-centred focus and within a record that tends towards extreme isolation and extreme clustering of sites. Now, sites, of course, are nothing more than just concentrations of a continuous behavioural landscape, and this needs to be reflected in our data and methodological choices. Um, as per uh, Rob Foley's uh, arguments for off-site archaeology, uh, I think the site as a discrete analytical unit is being challenged more and more, and spatial analysis is in a great position to provide alternative methodologies that break down the dichotomy between sites and the landscape. However, many landscape studies are still structured around the site as an analytical unit, either because they are effectively just looking out from an existing site uh, to the wider landscape to understand the site itself, um, or because pre-existing site location has given a lot of weight in, uh, in the analysis at the beginning of the model. Now, I think this is an issue if we accept that the behavioural landscape is in reality continuous because you will only be modelling one facet of that uh, behavioural landscape use. Now, the alternative is for a more sort of theory-led approach that focuses on the landscape first. And we should prioritise analyses that are not overly reliant on pre-existing site locations. Um, this also requires assumptions, but these assumptions are defined by the researcher explicitly rather than the implicit assumptions that underlie the use of sites as discrete spatial units. Uh, and I think we should means test our data sets uh, through literature arguments, also ground truthing. So in late Pleistocene Central Asia, for example, we have a broad area with very few known sites, but we want to understand broad issues of hominin dispersal and occupation. So in the Paleo Silk Road project here in Tübingen, uh, for instance, we're building our predictive model in a sort of iterative way. So our initial predictions are built from uh, an understanding of the wider landscape, geological, topographical, uh, etc. Um, and then ground truth in our fieldwork seasons. So that information is then fed back into the predictive model to be ground truth in the next field season. And this iterative approach of ground truthing will allow us even to challenge those basic assumptions that we used initially to build the model. And it gives us, I think, the best chance of getting at that continuous behavioural landscape without becoming fixated on just one facet or aspect of it. Um, and this is how we're approaching the problem caused by that threefold difficulty of site centrism, spatiotemporal isolation, and clustering, and weaknesses uh, of predictive models. Now, it's only one possible approach, so I'm very keen to you know, hear other possibilities. But ultimately, I think that theory-led approach, emphasising the continuous nature of the archaeological record, is what will help us mitigate some of those problems. Thank you.